Welcome back to Tartarian Tales 64 as we continue our travels in Siberia. There's just one more little part that I wanted to add on to that last one but didn't feel like I have enough time so I wanted to make another Tartarian Tales about it and it just pretty much relates to tattooing but it's got some interesting Tatar, Tatar tattooing interesting information kind of about that and a few other different things when uh, the author reads a, or kind of meets a, an interesting man that had some cool details and interesting thoughts that I felt were necessary to share but wanted to make it its own video because it was kind of separate topic than the other uh, selection of readings. It's a little further in the book. I think you will like it and I just picked a bunch of kind of little ink engravings, different ink kind of uh, in watercolor -y little artworks that are uh, just all over the place and t just ancient-esque. So enjoy those as well. Probably slide one of mine in the end, but either way, check out the book. Written beautifully, very interesting details laid throughout of just amazing observations of a time that again is just so awesome. Every time before cell phones, I am so envious of and I love my early self that was able to experience that time, thank God. But just, you know, the invention of that just changed everything. And going back to times like this that were so pure, and, you know, they're still not as, you know, they're not that prime, amazing, immaculate, renaissance, master age. But they're observing that, and they're kind of the remnants of that, like the trail off, the distant trail off, forgotten trail off of that. And it's just interesting because little things slick through the cracks, little details, that insight, and excellent little things that get passed on from these travelers, which just keeps on going, keeps on being cool. So here's the text, these couple pages. Definitely check them out. I think you will like them. So again, this writing is by Adolf Ehrman in the 1840s, and you can find the pages here on 136 through pretty much 140. I'll chime in from time to time to uh, see what we uh, come across here. 136. Notwithstanding this, however, there was something peculiarly engaging in his descriptions of Siberian scenery, owing to the primitive simplicity and striking uniformity of the social and natural condition of the land. It is by these local peculiarities and an expression of frank good nature attributable to the circumscribed range of ideas and pursuits that the poetry of Kuzmin and of M. Vrozov of Yakutsk is characterized. We'll have to check that out. It is a strange coincidence that the unsophisticated enjoyments of provincial life should be represented by those officers who have been withdrawn from the oppressive and corrupting influences of the Russian capital under the very same colors as they appeared to the Roman poets under the emperors. Many an ode composed in Krasnoyarsk might be found to accord with the feelings and sentiments of Horace. As a striking example of an opposite constitution of mind, however, we may quote the words of the poet Radyukov, who thus describes himself taking leave of one of his friends. Quote, Born in the steppe, a child of the icy zone, I am darkened with the smoke of the Tatar fires, like the yurts and the skins of the tents that afford me shelter. Shy as the beasts of the forest, or as the fish which flee from pursuit, the rude Siberian is dark and unsocial. His greeting is artless and brief, and even his parting words no more than, God guide thee, fare thee well, enjoy in the city all thou canst desire. The picture given by Stepanov of human existence on the northern tundras is, in the highest degree, expressive. They seem inaccessible to either joy or pain, the types of everlasting rest. Well might we wish that every governor were endued with the same poetic spirit in which he addresses some of the Tunguzus recommended to his care. Quote, Come ye timorous denizens of the wild. Come down to the river banks from your rocky homes and be my friends. In me ye shall find a brother, for I fear my fellow men no less than ye. It was also to my visit at Krasnoyarsk that I was indebted for an acquaintance I formed with an old Tungus from the circle of Yenisaisk, who had been for some time in the hospital here and was now preparing to return home. This man was distinguished from his brethren of the same tribe by blue lines tattooed upon his cheeks. 
This operation is performed here, as in the South Sea Islands, by rubbing finely powdered charcoal into punctures made with needles in the skin. Instead of the charcoal, Indian ink, as I was informed, is sometimes used, which the Tungusis have apparent opportunities of procuring through their intercourse with the natives of the countries bordering on southern Siberia. The names by which tobacco, as well as pipes and sulfur, is known to the Tungusis, be, being of Chinese origin, would suggest that they have drawn those articles in the earliest ages from China, where the peltry of their more northern neighbors is so highly prized. This account, given by eyewitnesses of the mode of tattooing, is much more credible than another which is traditional in Siberia. By the Russians, the operation of tattooing is expressed by the term vuishavat, to ornament with needlework, so that a tattooed face is said to be embroidered. It is probably therefore from a mere etymological misconception that the notion has arisen that the dark figures traced on different parts of the persons of the Tunguzis and others are black threads drawn under the skin. The lines upon the hands of the Ostiac women, at least, as well as of, of, on, upon the faces of the Tunguzis, whom I examined here, are evidently mere punctures on a level with the surrounding skin, whereas they should rise considerably above it if formed by threads left underneath. The more so, as the needles brought to the northern markets must always be thick and strong enough to sew with the sinews of the reindeer. The fine ones, which I offered to the Ostiaks on the Obi, were rejected as useless. This good-humored old man showed us some of his national dances, which precisely resemble those of the Tunguses on the Aldan. He described how each man offered his right hand to a woman, and that they then formed a circle in which they moved slowly round, keeping time to the cadence of certain words. It is affirmed by the Russians, however, who have visited Turukansk, that those dances do not always end with the same gravity with which they begin, but upon certain occasions become almost as licentious as those of the Sus Linux or the Agathirsi, sound Hindu and Buddhist. I attempted to come at the truth of this assertion from the Tungus with an interpreter, but though he understood some Russian, he had much difficulty in expressing his meaning in that language. Still, I thought I could gather from him that he did not intend to gainsay the imputation altogether, for he appeared to understand the words which, as the Russians allege, are the signal of preparation for the looter orgies. The marriage tie is considered indissoluble by the northern Tunguses, and though they allow a plurality of wives, these are generally treated with kindness and affection, though it is usual to resign one of them to the Russian adventurers who visit the tundras in the summer, from whom they expect a share of the proceeds of their hunting excursions in return. <laughs> With regard to ethnographical subjects, I must note a most interesting collection of Siberian antiquities in the possession of M. Stepanov. It principally contains articles of bronze found in the Kurgans, or strangers' graves as they are called in the circle of Minusinsk, at the foot of the Seyan and Kuznetsk mountains. In addition to the fragments of weapons, mining tools, and trinkets already described by Spassky and others, we were here shown a number of circular metallic discs of four or six inches diameter, one surface of which was polished for a mirror, while the opposite side was uniformly furnished with a sort of button, having a hole drilled through it, and which was evidently intended for a handle. The exterior rim surrounding this button was ornamented with elegant figures in relief, which as well as on the other articles were almost always representations of animals. I was much surprised at never seeing among these the argali, or wild sheep, which is so constantly found upon the monumental relics of the nomadic Siberian tribes, whereas the ass, which is in such universal request in the southern adjacent countries, occurred in almost every compartment. The most important consideration, however, is that these mirrors are found in graves, which as the present Tatar inhabitants of the circle maintain, belong to a race now extinct and totally different from theirs. Totally different from theirs. And now extinct. So sad. How many races have gone extinct? Just like this. How many? So many. Could have been any form of human. There could be so many different variations. We have no idea. The colors and races we know of now that are, occur in this world could be but a small fraction of what uh, were once existed and have become extinct. Terribly. 
Uh, okay, here we go. Now we know that mirrors precisely similar to these are still in use among the Bureyets in their religious ceremonies, and that they are peculiar to the ritual of the Buddhists, and they thereby furnish another argument for the antiquity and extended influence of this remarkable creed. It might at the same time admit of debate whether those primitive tribes whose existence is now only attested by the peculiarity of their burial places in their enterprise and prize in search of ores were really a race so distinct from the modern inhabitants of Siberia as might be presumed from the name of Chudes or strangers given them by their Russian successors. If any weight could be attached to an appellation so variously applied, might it not be maintained that the Chudes were the ancestors of the modern Ostjaks, a designation indisputably derived from the Tataric word Ustjak, a stranger? Here again, however, our present information is at fault. The name Ostjak is itself equivocally bestowed. We find it given to a tribe in the north of the present government of Yeniseisk, whose mother tongue bears a close affinity to the Samoyedesh, and still closer to that of the Yarinci in Krasnoyarsk, and who are, notwithstanding traditionally acknowledged by the Ostiaks of the Obi as a branch of their own stock. The following account of their origin was given to M. Stepanov by one of the chiefs of the Ostiaks of Yeniseisk. Once, as our horde journeyed from the setting towards the rising sun, it was found upon their coming to the river Tas that but four of each sex remained alive. These two must have perished of hunger, but that one of them was an inspired soothsayer, or Chivochi Bui Cub, on a sudden wings, appeared upon his shoulders. He first raised himself into the air, then darted down into the Tas, and emerged with his body hung round with fish. Henceforward his companions became fishermen. Homer seems to have thought that fishing was the last resource of hunger. This would sound strange to one brought up on the borders of the teeming rivers of Siberia, and could only be imagined to hold true in the case of recent emigration. Accordingly, we find the rich and delicate sustenance derived from the waters so much esteemed at last that posterity comes to regard the art of taking fish as an endowment from heaven. The result of my observations on the wells of Podielniki made it desirable to note the temperature of some running stream in this vicinity near its source. I was consequently glad to learn that there were several copious springs about Krasnoyarsk and made an excursion on the 28th of January to ascertain this point and examine the rock formations in the valley of the Yenisei. Upon M. Stepanov's suggestion, I availed myself of the company of a gentleman holding a public appointment who had acquired a complete knowledge of every circumstance connected with the government of Yeniseisk and its inhabitants. Our route lay westward at first along the Yenisei at the foot of the hills, which were just against the northeast end of the city, and where we intended to visit a little rivulet which rises from them known by the name of the Roaring Well. Notwithstanding this imposing title, we were assured by the peasants in the neighborhood that its source was completely hidden under the snow, but that we should be able to gratify ourselves at Basaika, which lay a little lower down on the right bank of the Yenisei. Here we came to a wide chasm through which the Basaika flows into the Yenisei. Its sides are formed of high and steep cliffs of picturesque outline, being a succession of parallel ridges following the direction of the main river, which here runs east and west. The remote background of this valley is closed by the peak of Kuisumsk, which is of gigantic or, or granitic formation, though the steep strata on either side of the streamlet consist of dark brown shivery limestone, yielding, when rubbed, a strong sulfurous odor, and pierced here and there with seams of white calcareous spar. The dip of the stratification was to the northwest, as might be expected from the characteristic features of the hills just noticed, as well as from those of the valley of the Yenisei itself as Krasnoyarsk, and as long as the valley takes an easterly direction, it has the longitudinal character presenting to the river the edges of the rocky strata which form its sides. I wonder if some of the chemical and sulfurous com uh, composition that they're finding could relate to some kind of incident that happened. You know, if some kind of catastrophic thing did happen, it would have had lingering remnants for a while and then in our time it's now being covered up by Dunkin Donuts cups and masks so we can't find it anymore but at some point there could be little these clues this guy I love this writer the fountain of which 
is uh, we were in search was discovered on the right bank of the rivulet into which its waters are discharged. After shoveling away the snow, which stood two feet deep upon it, we exposed a powerful jet of water, issuing from a fissure which crossed the strata in a horizontal direction and following, in, following into a basin in the limestone rock below. During several trials, I found the thermometer to rise from negative 15 degrees at which it stood in the air to plus 3 to 10 degrees when it was plunged into the water. The copiousness of the spring would seem to guarantee its admissibility as a standard of the internal heat, at least that this cannot be less than plus 3 to 10, or for a Krasnoyarsk. I was agreeably surprised to find the gamorous pulex in great quantities in this spring. It was from 6 inches to 8 something long it might be inches i don't know it's four three dots and the females had the space between the second and fifth rings filled with black round eggs there were also many specimens of the acellus aquaticus and nipa cinerea swimming in the water they owed their preservation no doubt to the covering of snow by which they pr were protected from the external to cold which today was negative 15 degrees r the general aspect of the surrounding landscape was enough to pr prove the climate of this circle more favorable to vegetation than any other hitherto visited by us on the east side of the Ural. Thickets of birch and alder, occasionally intermixed, as we were told, with the black alder and medlar, covered the gentle slopes in the valley of Basaika, as far as the eye could reach, while both sides of the Yenisei were ribbed with furrows where the westerly winds had swept the snow from the dark and loamy soil. In some of the low grounds in Krasnoyarsk, the vegetable mold is from two to three feet thick and produces summer rye, wheat, and oats yielding eight, ten, and twelvefold. Their seed time does not begin before the, before the first week in May. We lingered a while in the agreeable little village situate on irregularly rising ground at the outlet of the valley. We found the cottages of the peasants, as usual, extremely neat, in their dress likewise indicative of a superior degree of comfort. The men were handsome doki of goatskins, and the women the seraphin and taila greca of colored silks. They presented us with some watermelons, which thrive here in the open air, when the beds are well manured. They are sliced and kept in salt and water, like cucumbers. Even that, even that little bit. I love watermelons. I've never even conceived of slicing them as cucumbers. But it's interesting to see what these Tartars and these ancient people do, because their food was probably better than ours. Ours is turning to filth. And it just, I, I love this. I love this book. Definitely check out more of it. Just the interesting details and the things that people learn in these books, these adventurers that talk to the older people, that talk to the 90-year-olds, the 80-year-olds, and learn little bits of things. Everything from their mythology to their, just their culture, the way they got tattooed, the way they moved, the places they've been, the people they've seen, the things that they've known that they might have talked to uh, when, from an 80-year-old 80 80 person even further back. So that's really, I mean, the word of mouth, it, when you live in a world like us where information is just destroyed for the benefit of the controller, they then you have to have word of mouth stuff. That's almost the only way for certain things to survive, as well as being buried, treasure troves. In this hot spring, you know, different hot spring, these people knew about all these. They knew how to survive in this time without bottled water, without any of this stuff. They just knew how to do it. Everything they do, everything they observe, the experiences they make, they're just so, so nice, so pure, so all encompass encompassing, so like in the moment, really, you know, taking in as much as they can. And it must have been really incredible to be an observer at this time. But I, except in the, the, besides the cold, that part I would probably not really like. I maybe would have tried going in the summer, but either way, incredible that these stories that, that come out, the tales about the wives, about the, the dances, about, uh, you know, everything. It just always gives an impression that's interesting. Even the part at the end that it talked about the, the upper, the altered terrain on the coast that they were at. It's like... God, when was all that terrain? When was was there a point when all way in the distant past when all that we see now as altered terrain, hills, valleys, mountains, crags, all this stuff, when all of that was something, whether it was trees or old buildings, or old walls, old things, old structures that turned to rubble, it I really get the impression that at one point there was a time when this place was fully developed and just absolutely in harmony with itself, I guess, until something destroyed it. Some evil force came and destroyed it. But 
who knows all theory again stemming from the imagination inspired by whatever I can find so I hope you all uh, add your insights in the comments I love hearing it and stay tuned for more Tartarian Tales bless you all